gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down.
really quiet. Let's just get really quiet. Let's just get really quiet.
bless you, Jesus. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. I will exalt you. And not simply because you're with me, just because you are. I will exalt you. Praise you, Jesus. Father, you see what's happening here more than we do. And I thank you, Father. I thank you so much. Your presence is precious. It's wonderful. It's soothing. It's comforting. And I'm so glad that I have made the choices that have led me to this point with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your guidance. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. May your glory be strong, Father, here and everywhere that people are watching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Bless you. Glory and honor to you, Lord. Father, may our worship not just be an experience, but a lifestyle. I love you. Father, I'm glad I'm here tonight. I'm glad others are here. People are watching. Holy Spirit, move freely in our midst. Accomplish the purpose of Almighty God. And we rejoice in knowing that our names are written in that glorious book of life. And Jesus, we look forward to your return. Hallelujah. Praise you, praise you, Jesus. You are Lord. You are Lord. Glory and honor to you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. May we choose to cast down the burdens, the burdens of this world, and rejoice, Father, at the peace that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, why don't you take a moment or two and just tell somebody you're glad to see them. Don't lie.
Hello, everybody. Here and there. Hello, world. Don't know how many billions are watching tonight, but you're, you're all welcome. We're glad to have you. I do want to offer an apology. First off, if I embarrass the Legault family this morning with... <laughs> Now, seriously, I, I'm, okay, well then, apology number two, I, I'm sincerely sorry that I did not open the sermon with a joke this morning. <laughs> what? See, part of the problem is some of the jokes I know are, old people would know them and understand them, but some of you younger people, I just don't, I just don't know. You do know that I'm fighting the temptation right about now, don't you? Okay. What do you call a bird that plays the trumpet? Owl hurt. (laughs) Now, see, I knew not everybody would get that one. How many of you understood that joke? Lift your hand. See there? I knew that only the old people would understand. There was a trumpeter back in the 50s, 60s, and very early 70s named Al Hurt. One of the best trumpeters you will ever have heard in your life. Absolutely incredible. And if you go on YouTube and type in Green Hornet TV theme song and listen to it, he's the guy playing the trumpet on that song. It's one of the most incredible trumpet solos I have ever heard. So that joke was only good for you old people. Thank you for sort of laughing. I appreciate that. And I wouldn't have known that joke if Barry hadn't told me. (laughs) See, I could go to a nursing home and tell that joke, and they would still be laughing. (laughs) Well, either laughing or saying, what'd he say? What'd he say? Okay, let's sort of like move on to the sermon. Good idea, yeah, (laughs) praise God. (laughs) Have you ever fought the emotions of being tired of witnessing to people? Now, I know that as good Christians, we're not supposed to admit to it, but the truth is, don't you just kind of get tired of like really good friends or family members? It's like, come on, man, what's the deal? You know, don't you get it? Well, the truth is, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. I want to share something with you that I heard a preacher mention, and this was not his sermon. He just mentioned this in the sermon and Boom, you know, just like the light went off. It's like, yeah, really? So we're going to start in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Now what's happened, Jesus has uh, been crucified and he's raised from the dead. And in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, 
For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And it says that as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So what we see here is that these two women, Mary and Mary Magdalene, They saw the resurrected Jesus. He appeared unto them. Now turn to Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. We'll pick this up. What's happened? Jesus has resurrected. He's appeared to the two Marys. And now he he appears to these two men that are on what's referred to as the road to Emmaus. And in verse 13... It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have uh, one to another? as you walk and are sad. So they begin to explain to them, you know what, you're the only person that hasn't heard that Jesus has been crucified, so on and so forth. Well, you jump over to verse 30, and it says, And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight, and they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures. So now Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, has appeared unto these two men on this road to Emmaus. Now turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And in verse 19 it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Well, this is talking about the the twelve minus Judas, or eleven. So now the resurrected Jesus has appeared unto the eleven apostles. And in John 21, verse 1, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And then he swam, swam to shore. Now, I just want to interject this. I have, uh, fishing has never been an interest of mine. But if somehow you should ever talk me into going fishing with you, please keep your clothes on. For if you don't, I will jump into the sea (laughs) and swim away as fast as I can. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Beginning in verse 1, 
It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, or some of them who saw him have died. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So we see there's a whole bunch of people listed here that the resurrected Jesus appeared to. Well, let's get a little bit more information about what exactly happened when he appeared to these people? In other words, when Jesus showed up, what did they see? Well, look over in Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. And we'll begin reading in verse 36. The two fellows on the road to Emmaus they went running to the uh, remaining apostles and began explaining to them what happened. And in verse 36, And as they, spake, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed, now look here, and supposed that they had seen a what? A spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Well, we see Jesus telling them, I'm not a spirit, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones. Now, I could go a whole long direction on this one, relative to what a lot of people claim to have encountered concerning spiritual visitations. Well, he says, A spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. Okay, well, that's good. And then he says, you know, Here are my hands, my feet. Okay, well, that's good. But what does that mean? Well, to get clarity on that one, turn over to John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, why thrust my hand into his side? Because that's where they, the spear, remember that? And after eight days again with his disciples, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he unto Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So what have we just learned? Well, in everything that we've just learned, read here, all of this, Jesus died, but he rose from the dead. And then he appeared unto several people. Some people he appeared to them more than once. Hundreds of people, absolutely, just hundreds of people saw the resurrected Jesus. Well, to clarify exactly what it was they saw, 
we see that Jesus appeared and he said, don't be afraid, a spirit does not have flesh and, blo- flesh and bones as you see me have. In other words, I am not a spirit. You're not looking at a... He wasn't saying I don't have a spirit. He was saying, you're not looking at a spirit. You are looking... Now listen closely to this. You are looking at a human body that's been glorified. You're looking at a human body. You say, well now, wait a minute. How do you know that that was a human body? Okay. (laughs) Need I go here? (laughs) Um, In God's realm, the spirit, God is a spirit. Jesus says a spirit does not have flesh and bones. Who has flesh and bones? Humans. So Jesus says, I am a human. Do you understand this? I'm not trying to confuse you guys. Really, I'm not. But then he says, and and this one's going to mess up some people's theology. He shows them the the apostles, he says, see my hands and my feet, my side. Then they tell Thomas, and Thomas says, I ain't believing this until I see him for myself and I put my finger in the nail prints and my hand into his side. And they said, whatever. Well, I put that part in there myself. (laughs) Then Jesus, says, eight days later, Jesus appears and says, Thomas, how's it going, buddy? And Thomas, you know, wide-eyed. Jesus said, here, feel my hands. Here, put your hand in my side. Thomas, go ahead. Now, what have we learned? We've learned that Jesus has a human body, flesh and bone, And there are nail prints and a hole on his side. Do you follow me? You just read it yourself. (laughs) Now, do you remember... Okay. I can't reference it. I have to show you. Turn to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 6, when they... Jesus and the apostles were uh, therefore were come together. They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Like manner. He will return in like manner as you've seen him go up. How did they see him? They saw Jesus in a flesh, bone, body that had nail prints in his hands, feet, and hole in the side. And as they looked at Jesus in that resurrected body, he ascended back to the Father. And those two men in white said, why are you guys standing here looking? In the same way, like manner, that you've seen him go up, you will see him come back. 
This means when He comes back, He will be in a flesh, bone, body with nail prints in His hands, nail prints in His feet, and a hole in His side. Do you realize it is in that condition Jesus will exist for all eternity? Please let that sink in. I ain't never heard nothing like this in my whole life. Well, probably not. (laughs) But have we not just read it in Scripture? I'm not trying to trick you. What I'm trying to do is point something out to you that a lot of people seem to ignore. And if he has the nail prints in his hands and feet and hole in his side, do you know what he has on his head? Crown of glory. What else? Scars from the crown of thorns. You understand that? This is his condition for all eternity. Now this would come as a real shock to some people. But this is part of the price that he paid for us. Okay, now we're we're headed someplace in this. What we've established then is that the resurrected Jesus looks like us. I mean, obviously we don't have nail prints and all that, but he ate. He ate. With a glorified body, he ate. That means, I don't mean to be weird here, but he had, has glorified teeth, glorified lips, glorified tongue, glorified Esophagus? <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying? But now, here's the part that throws me a curve. He just appeared in rooms where the doors were closed. But he has flesh and bones and can eat. How does that work? I don't know. (laughs) Maybe someday we'll be in a giant classroom and and the Holy Spirit will stand up at at the glorified whiteboard and draw out the formula, how it works. I don't know, but it's there. It's there in the Word. Now let's turn to Matthew 26 and see some more about all of what's happened that kind of led up to all this. Well, Matthew 26, in verse, oh, let's see here, 57. Now, Jesus has been arrested, and it says here that they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Says Peter followed, but you know he kind of stayed away during the trial. And verse 59 says that the chief priests, elders, and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Well, you jump ahead during this trial, and it says the high priest, verse 65, rent his clothes. Now it's Caiaphas, the high priest saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They, plural, answered. Who are the they? The they are the chief priests, verse 59, elders and the council. They said, He is guilty of death. Then they spit on him and hit him and all this other. Now look over in Luke 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. Now that's a lie. Saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest. 
Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault with this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man, Jesus, were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. In other words, you know, put on a show for me. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Now turn back over to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor, that's Pilate, took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him to crucify, to crucify him. Now, what we didn't read is where they, you know, beat him with the whip and so forth. But what we wanted to identify is enough in this. Now, here's what I'm getting at. In this part that we've read, the last, well, Matthew 26, Luke 23, and Matthew 27, here are people who saw Jesus right before he was crucified. Caiaphas, the high priest, chief priests, elders, the council, false witnesses, Pilate, Herod, scribes, and soldiers. All those people saw Jesus prior to his crucifixion. None of them believed who he was. None of them. So here we have a really interesting situation. Jesus is crucified. He's raised from the dead. And he appears to two Marys, the two on the road to Emmaus, the apostles. He appears to over 500 people. And the grand total number of people that he appeared to, we really don't know because it's just 500 and many others and so on and so forth. It could have been six, seven, eight hundred people grand total. That, I mean, he appeared to all of those people. Why in the world did he not appear before Caiaphas, Pilate, the, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the council, the soldiers that beat him, whipped him, drove the nails into his... Why didn't he appear before them? Because they were the ones who accused him and basically said, you are not who you think you are and who people say you are. You are going to die. And they killed him. Now, I don't know about you, but... You know, when you think about it, I, I would imagine that maybe if he appeared in his resurrected form in front of Pilate, <laughs> you know, just like there's Pilate in his bedroom getting ready for bed, and then Jesus, boop, he just shows up. I mean, he did it before. Why not just show up in his bedroom? Pilate, turn around. Pilate turns around. Who are you? Wait a minute, I know you. You're the guy they crucified. See my hands? See my feet? See my side? Would you like to see my back where they whipped me? Would you like to see the imprints of the crown of thorns? Pilate, I am what they said. I am the Christ. Why didn't he appear before Pilate? Why didn't he appear before Caiaphas? The high priest, 
I mean, if you can get the high priest convinced of who you are, that high priest will stand up and say, this man that we had crucified, look ye at him. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the one that we have been telling you about. That high priest is going to have a huge amount of influence over all of the Jews. Why not appear before Caiaphas? In fact, why not? Because we know they all got together after Jesus had raised from the dead. Remember, the, the people said, well, he raised from the dead. And they said, oh, no, we can't have that story going around. And, and in another place, it talks about how they paid off the soldiers. Okay, well, why not in the middle of a council meeting just show up <laughs> in front of the whole bunch? Hey, guys, remember me? Jesus? Hey, I'm alive. Why not? Why not? It seems to me like you could have had a, a huge impact on the people you just died for if you showed up to them too. But he didn't. He didn't. And you know, I, I kind of wondered about that. Why wouldn't it show up to them? Why only these other people? Well, let me show you something. Turn over to Luke chapter 16. And I'll share with you what Scripture seems to imply. In Luke chapter 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Here's your key. Right here. Why appear before people who aren't going to be persuaded? Why? Let me show you some more about this. Turn over to John chapter 11. In fact, keep your finger here in Luke. We'll come right back to it in a moment. But in John chapter 11. And what's happened, um, you know, Lazarus was sick. This different Lazarus now. And he died. And then Jesus shows up. And in verse 38 of John chapter 11, it says, Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. You know, I just, this amazes me. You're upset because your brother died, then Jesus shows up, and, you know, he, he tells you to roll away the Why would you tell me to roll away the stone unless you're going to do something really cool? And she's worried about what he smells like? <laughs> You must not miss him that much. <laughs> well, anyway, Jesus says, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, 
Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. Now one thing I can tell you is he did not stink. <laughs> Loose him and let him go. Well, in chapter 12, verse 1, Then six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which uh, was which had been ra- whom he raised from the dead. So six days before the Passover, he goes to Bethany. This is where Lazarus had been raised from the dead. In verse 10, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So this is incredible. They're, they're trying to make it, they want to kill Jesus. And they admit that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And they're trying to, number one, re-kill him thinking that if we kill him again, maybe this time Jesus can't raise him. But they're also trying to kill somebody who has the power to raise the dead. Now there was a song by Jim Croce years ago, something about some guy that rough, tough, mean and gruff, his name was Jim. And in the chorus of the song, it said something about you don't pull on Superman's cape. Remember that? Okay, these guys are talking about pulling on Superman's cape. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Somebody who's got the power to raise the dead, and you know they did it. You know this person did it. And you are so messed up, you're trying to figure, how can we kill him, and then also kill this other guy that got raised from the dead? This is bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. And when Jesus made that statement about, look, if they're not going to believe what's written, they're not going to believe if somebody is raised from the dead. Here's the proof. Isn't it interesting? This, to me, this is really ironic that we have, I mean, it, we're not talking coincidence here, okay? But Jesus gives this illustration about a guy named Lazarus who dies and The rich man says, raise Lazarus from the dead and send him to my family and they will believe. And Jesus, in in sharing this story, says, even if somebody's raised from the dead, they'll not believe. You want the proof of that? I'm going to raise a guy named Lazarus from the dead. And he's going to be seen of many people and folks will not believe. Isn't it interesting? The very name. You get the irony of it all. Now, if you look, again, um, I said, hold your place here in in, uh, Luke chapter 16. Notice in verse 29, Abraham says to the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. The rich man says, no, Father Abraham, But if somebody went to them from the dead, they will repent. In other words, this guy is admitting, my family does not believe the word. And Abraham said to him, hey, look, if they're not going to believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. With this in mind, turn over... To John 20. John chapter 20, verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. What is being emphasized here? That which is written. These things are written that you might believe. 
If they're not going to believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe somebody who gets raised from the dead. If they're not going to believe what the Word of God has to say today, they're not going to believe if Jesus Christ himself appears today in front of them. Now, that's something we have to get settled in our minds because a lot of times I believe we convince ourselves if Jesus would just appear before everybody, if he'd just show up at the family reunion, they'd all get saved. No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. And the proof of that is in Scripture. The whole thing about let's kill Jesus. You mean the guy that's got the power to raise the dead? Yeah, let's go kill him. And while we're at it, let's kill the guy that he raised from the dead and let's just see if he stays dead this time. Excuse me, are you people listening to yourself? (laughs) Obviously not. You know what that also means? It means that those, the, the Jewish leaders who put Jesus to death, They did not truly believe Moses and the prophets. Let that sink in. There are a lot of Christians today that fall into that category of backsliders. And we're praying, oh God, you know, restoration, restoration. We believe they're going to come back and so forth. Well, hopefully they will. And maybe we've thought, boy, if Jesus could show up at their bedside, just show up. Just while they're driving down the road, you know, just show up in the seat next to them. Just, if Jesus could just manifest, then they'd, they'd repent and they'd come back. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because if they are not going to believe what God has stated in his word then what makes you think the resurrected Jesus appearing before them is going to convict them enough that they'll repent? And they're even Christians. You say, well, is there any hope? Well, yeah, there's hope. Sure there's hope. The Holy Spirit is convicting. Don't ever think he's not. He is convicting. I mean, Jesus said, look, he's going to be sent. One of the things he's going to do is, you know, convict or convince the world of their lack of righteousness and so forth. So the Holy Spirit is convicting. See, we look at what's happening to our friends and family, and we don't see any change in them. So it can be easy for us to think, why isn't God doing anything? Well, what makes you think he's not? Because if he were, they would change. Oh, really? Just like all those people who saw Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, they changed? You mean those people who changed? What about all the people who had been raised, who who knew Jesus had been crucified, and the story got back to them that he had been raised from the dead? I mean, Pilate heard about it. The chief priest heard about it. A whole bunch of them heard about it, and they still didn't believe Instead, they tried to find the apostles and kill them. <laughs> and and you think anything has changed today? It hasn't. You say, well, what do we do? Just you know, like throw up our hands and quit? Oh no. Because see, unless we get some kind of supernatural divine revelation, we do not know how hardened the heart of our loved ones and friends. We do not know how seared the conscience of believers who have backslidden. We don't know. Unless we get some kind of supernatural revelation from God and he says, you might as well stop praying because it's not going to work. So we continue to pray. And see, there's one thing that I know for an absolute fact. I know for a certainty. When I pray for, well, for example, when I pray for uh, our president... Here's how I pray. Say, Father, I lift up to you our president and all of our national, um, national, state, and local leaders. And I've already told him, that includes every political office, every judge, everything. And this time of year, I also say, and I lift up all the candidates in all positions for every election throughout this country. 
And I ask you to continue sending into their lives laborers. Send in sowers, send in waterers, and send in harvesters. And I call them born again, filled the Holy Spirit, and in the church that you know is best for them. And I ask you to make your, your holiness and your love so strong in their presence that there is conviction. Now, I stand here before you, and I guarantee you, guarantee you, guarantee you, God is answering that prayer. You know why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if I'm praying for that to be fulfilled in the life of another person, you know what? (laughs) Healing, prosperity, and all that other stuff aside, I know that God is working as much as he can in the lives of those people and in family members. I pray for your, your children that way. You know, God, I mean, the same, along the same lines. See, when I pray like that, I know it's being answered. I know it's being answered. That's what Jesus came for. So I know for a fact these people are being convicted. I know it. But just because I don't see the results that I want to see, it doesn't mean that God isn't moving. He is moving. And, and, and your, your friends and loved ones who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they, it's like they're wacky and they're weird. And you're praying and you're asking God, You know, God, show them what they're doing. God, you don't think he is? The last thing God needs is a bunch of flaky children running around the earth acting stupid and foolish and, and, quote, making Christianity look dumb. You understand what I mean? So don't tell me he's not doing everything he can to convict them of of unforgiveness and and just all the junk that they're doing. Don't tell me he's not convicting them. I'll guarantee you he is. I guarantee you by the blood of Jesus Christ, he is. The problem is, if they're not going to believe the word, they're not going to believe somebody appearing before them who's raised from the dead. This is the harsh reality. And somebody might say, well, Brother Martin, I just don't know if I want to believe that because I, I just honestly, I think, I, I mean, I just, I just tell you now, I believe that, that if he appeared to Uncle Joe, my Uncle Joe would be saved. Well, maybe Uncle Joe would. Maybe he would. Maybe. But we have right here in the Word of God that if they're not going to believe the Word, see, you know what that tells me? God's Word is filled with his life and is alive with his life. Therefore, when I open this and I begin reading, I am delivering life and conviction to people. Because this book is full of the holy life of God. It is the holy life of God. So when it is delivered to somebody who is not born again, meaning they're unholy, there is a clash. When it is delivered to Christians who are turning their back to their righteousness, there's conviction. Because this is life. Jesus said, you know, my words are spirit. And their life. This is life. Therefore, I cannot judge the effectiveness of God's word by what I see in the lives of other people. Because I know that God is working. I know he's working. But there are a lot of people... See, those chief priests, the high priest... The religious leaders, they should have known better. In fact, Jesus even said as much. He said, search the scriptures. You think the very fact that you have them is what's guaranteed you eternal life. But no, these scriptures are pointing you to me. And you won't receive it. Same thing today. The word of God is still pointing people to Jesus Christ. The Word of God is still pointing people to holiness and to righteousness. The Word of God 
is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. So I know this. I know this. Jesus really doesn't have to appear. Because if a person's heart has not been sealed, seared, and hardened, the power of this word being sown into their lives can bring about change. So no, don't give up hope. Don't do that. But remember, if people didn't believe when Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, I mean, think of it like this. He appears to, what, maybe a grand total of 600 people? (laughs) How many were in that upper room? About 120. Okay, where's the rest of them? Where's the rest of them? Well, maybe they had to go to the dentist or something. Well, <laughs> well, okay, maybe they did. Do you remember the story? This is, I'm not going to go long on this. Do you remember the story where there was a, a banquet being held? And the householder said, go out and invite them. And then some of these people said, well, you know, I'd go. But I just bought, you know, some ox. And i got to go check them out, make sure that they know how to plow the field. And the other guy says, man, I'd sure like to attend your, your banquet there, but I just married a wife. And I've always wondered whose wife. <laughs> You're talking yours, right? <laughs> they made all these excuses. You know what? There's a bunch of people that made excuses to not be in that upper room. And they saw the resurrected Jesus. Same thing today, guys. Same thing today. When we pray, Father, please move with holy conviction on whoever. You don't think he isn't? You don't think he's not? You better believe he is. But if that person just shuts it down and will not receive it, won't acknowledge it, will not call upon the name of the Lord, just, they just won't, Nothing you can do. But I'm telling you right now, when you pray for your family members and your friends, God, please open their eyes. God, please reveal your love. God, let your love fill their presence. Let them sense conviction. He, I'm telling you, he does it. He's doing it. How many of us sense that, what we call that wooing of the Lord, before we finally said yes to Jesus Christ? Perfect example. You know exactly what I'm talking about here tonight. Well, thank God I gave in. Thank God I said yes to Jesus Christ. Greatest day of my life. Hallelujah. Second greatest day was when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Third greatest day, when I married her. (laughs) Praise God. So listen, you know, don't get discouraged Keep in mind God is moving and put this thing out of your head. If only this would happen. If only that would happen. If only they could see a miracle. If only, how many people saw miracles and still rejected the risen Jesus? It's no different today, guys. Stay focused on Jesus. Stay in prayer and know God is moving. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and stand. Father, I thank you for this tonight because sometimes it's easy to think that you're not moving because we don't see people crying out to Jesus. We don't see change. We don't see results. But Father, you honor your word. And when we lift people up in prayer, you're moving in their lives as much as you can. And if they reject it, There's nothing you or anybody else can do. But I thank you, Father, that I know, that I know, that I know, when I lift people up to you and ask you to move into their lives, make yourself real, your love, all of this, I know you're doing what you can. I know it. I know it. So, Father, my recourse 
is to just stand on your word and continue believing what you've promised. Bless your holy name. And Father, my declaration is this. For all the people here, all the people watching, all the people listening, those of us who have what I'll call wayward family members, I say it's not too late for them. You know their hearts, I don't, but my confession is it's not too late for them. And that, Father, they will call upon the name of the Lord and the backsliders will return and the lost will be saved. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your holy name, Lord. Glory and honor to you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, praise you, praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory and honor to you, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. Bless your holy name. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the comfort that it brings. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. To all of you that are watching, hold on to this. Remember this. God is moving. He's answering those prayers. Praise you, Jesus. And I just believe the day's coming when those of you, your friends, your family members, we're going to see them in here. Hallelujah. We will see. You'll have to get here early to find a seat. Say, oh, Brother Martin, you're being silly. Well, no, not really. If the whole bunch of you had friends and family members that are lost, I'll get saved and start coming in all at the same time. We might have to hunt and search for seats. That's okay. I've already got mine up here, see? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. By Jesus' stripes, you were healed. You were healed. You were healed. You say, Brother Martin, why do you say that all the time? Well, I don't say it all the time. I just say it a lot of times. But the reason I do that is because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and by Jesus' stripes you were healed. I keep saying that. Eventually somebody's going to believe it and see healing manifest. Hallelujah. I call you healed. I call you healed. You'd smack me if I called you sick. <laughs> I call you healed. Praise God. Well, listen, we're going to go ahead and dismiss. If you have an offering tonight, please bring it up. Like me to pray with you anything? Uh, about anything, I'll do that as well. But you guys, have a blessed evening. And the rest of this week, it's going to be you know, your, the typical what we do every week schedule. So you have a blessed evening, and we'll see you next time.